Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, uh, how do you feel about getting in touch with, like, your, uh, spirit animal? I need some peyote if I want to get in touch with my spirit animal, Nathan. That or, that or some acid, I don't know. Well, you know, you could also spit some acid, and that actually brings us to something we wanted to, uh, <laughs> discuss that's on segue, this show. Though. Maybe. This is the, that's the segue you're getting. It's not the segue that you deserve, but it's the segue you need. So, you're probably aware, in Dungeons & Dragons, that, uh, there are, like, Kind of some traditional races, and then after, like, Volo's Guide uh, and into Ravnica, when they started to add races, they had a lot of almost uh, monstrous races that were based off of animals. I mean, they do in the Monster Manual also have these races, like gnolls, mm-hmm. lizard folk, uh, kobolds, goblins, things like that as well. They just weren't playable characters. I mean, they technically originally. aren't off limits they have rules to play them Mm. but they're not typical and they're not in the player's handbook but back in 3.5 you would have say lizard folk and then you would have uh lizard folk is player characters and you would have their stat adjustments Mm -hmm. and you would have their level adjustment because that was a thing back then i don't think now they would have that um now it would just Mm. be lizard folk gets these traits and yeah uh, they just they have get, rules for it yeah you, you can basically break it down from the monster manual by taking their special abilities and qualities and traits like dark vision or mm-hmm. spell like abilities that they have from not class levels mm. um so you can easily take stuff from the monster manual and make it a playable race um, oh so i could i could actually just make my unicorn pretty easily is what you're saying i mean yeah you would just take a base unicorn from the the book like even though they have not made officially the rules for a player class yeah you I like mean, a player race it'd be difficult because you'd have to give it a higher intelligence so it could talk and stuff but yeah you could. that was always my problem was thinking about like uh since it's not built as a player character that it would be uh correctly balanced and made sense as a player character it would it um, would be a magic unicorn of course so uh always it's always a magic unicorn you, you can name it Charlie. Nope, Snowball. <laughs> we know we, we know who the we know who the unicorn is. But anyway, after after like Volos and forward, they actually started to build the the official balanced player races that you could play that were based off of uh, a lot of those those animals. So you ended up with the the Tabaxi, of course, the Tortle, which is what I'm mostly familiar with, um, and. Uh, the Kenku, the Aarakocra, the, yeah, the Bugbears. Bugbears bug has been in the Monster Manual, by the way. Yeah. Just, just they're, throwing that out there. That they're all, they're that they're that, not... that's existed forever. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. It's just that, uh... Hobgoblins. Uh, they were never built to be a, a player race. I, again, you say that, but they had stats. They did have you, stats. You could play them. Right. Again, just less but typical. They... Just like you could do trolls, just less typical. They didn't level accordingly, or could you? Could you just level them up the same way? Uh, in three character? five, you took your level adjustment, so they'd be x amount of levels counted as higher than their class level. So okay. if you had like a drow with a level adjustment like one or two, so playing a dark elf would mean okay. you're starting at the power level of a level like two character or level three character oh so you would advance in your class slower because mm-hmm. you start more powerfully i guess what i'm thinking is it didn't feel like when i look at different monsters and how they're laid out in the book the description and and the features of them are not as fleshed out as when i see what they did to the characters past volos they did seem to flesh out what those characters are capable of. And... Well, yeah, I mean, in the Monsters Manual, for instance, bugbears would have an entry about their stats and then kind of, like, what their society is like. Uh, I assume they'll have, since they're sort of goblinoid, they'll mm-hmm. have an entry there with it that tells you about, like, their tactics and, like, their society background, maybe, and some of that stuff. 
But where the player's mm-hmm. handbook, you have the player races, which are things people actually need to know more about. Um, mm-hmm. They tend to flesh those out a bit more. Yeah. Because it's more integral that. to your character building. Um, I see. Yeah. But, All right. you know, it's, it's not that you build stuff to be players, because you would still, if building a bugbear is the same as building a bugbear as a monster, because it would... You don't change the abilities or anything between a character and a monster bugbear. You just make sure that you have the abilities and you balance out what they can do and will be able to do. To simplify the whole thing, they actually did have official write-ups on all of them. So that you know when you're just choosing a player race, you just have them readily available. Yeah, that's that can way easier than sheet. that's way easier than going into the monster manual and doing it yourself. Trying to trying to work it out. Yeah, you can just you can just say, yeah, my character is this, and then you can use it, utilize it the same exact way as you could if you were a human or an elf. Or so you're gonna human. you're gonna play a unicorn. I'm gonna play a nightmare. You're gonna play a nightmare. Well, you know, if people listen to our uh, <laughs> our episode with James D'Amato. Uh, a nightmare is apparently my uh, my arch villain for for Snowball. Well, yeah, because nightmares are not unicorns; they don't have horns, but they are horses of darkness and fire. That must be fun for you. Are you going to call it a Braxis? Probably Hellion. Ghost Rider. Probably Hellion. You could call it Nicolas Cage. I don't know. We're done. So anyway, in more recent times, like since since some of the newer supplements, it's become pretty commonplace that you can play different kinds of monsters or anthropomorphic animals. Kajita has many wares. <laughs> Tabaxi is innocent of these crimes. So, uh, you can do those things, and it, uh, it got us to thinking about what are some other potential animals that you could turn into playable races. Yes. So, thoughts on that. What is your, like, first thought when it comes to a race, uh, uh like an actual creature that you could make into? Uh, lots of things. Lots of animals, lots of monsters you could turn into creature, uh, characters, playable mm-hmm. races. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't just have to go with the ones that already exist in the monster manual, for instance. For instance, you know, lizard folk are a thing. Why not have a variant of lizard folk that is a comma, 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 chameleon? You would have a chameleon and it was named, its name would be Karma. I, I mean, that would probably be what you name it, but but yeah. Or your actual race would be Carmelian. Carmelian? No, that's... No. Chameleon. Thought process on that. So, things we know about chameleon is that, like, they can change their colors and stuff, they can blend in. They would have How... bonuses to camouflage, uh, to being stealthy. Okay. Yeah, so stealth bonuses. Yeah. They would get bonuses to perception, because their eyes can go in different directions. Mm-hmm. So, so, for that stuff, you kind of take the traits of the creature you're looking at and kind of go, all right, well, what are things they can do? So a chameleon as a race, you'd get the, the camouflage, so you'd get bonus to stealth um, in any environment, really, because you mm. can blend. It, like, it would yeah. be something like, if you're in an environment for more than five minutes and you're, like, standing still for more than a minute or something like that, you can mm-hmm. blend your colors, but you'd also get a disadvantage, perhaps, to bluff based on your mood, because chameleons kind of change depending on their mood. So they could blend into the place they're with, but they might also have a disadvantage to, say, lying to people. So deception might not be their strong suit. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I would also think that their speed would be pretty, pretty low. I mean, I you you could still give it the same base speed as okay. like a uh, a dwarf, maybe. Okay, so like twenty five, thirty feet. Yeah, so it might okay. be slower than a human or an elf, but it would still be, you know, it's a bipedal animal at this point because mm-hmm. none of the player races okay. are really quadrupeds. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Except yeah. for maybe centaurs, but that that we don't count that. No, not centaurs. Uh, never, never centaurs. What are you talking about? That's crazy times. Um, okay, so yeah, no, I get the idea of a, of a chameleon. Could could you do something with the tongue? Sure, like, I mean, yeah. they actually, the tongue, when they spit it out, um, yeah. it, it's quick. So you could do something like that, like, able to grab onto things and retrieve them if they're light objects. Oh, you or... know what you do? They get sleight of hand bonuses. Because they, they'd, be, they'd be able to do pickpocketing from range. Um... Only if they can grab it with their tongue. 
uh, they maybe they just have a really sticky tongue. I mean, they do. That, yeah, that would actually make them perfect for rogues. Um, maybe, maybe. Because you know, they're, but they're, they'd they're also get a, naturally camouflaged. They would also get like a climb speed because they're able to stick to things kind of really good. I don't know if ca- uh, chameleons are sticky. Uh, no, but I would imagine their their climb speed would be like relative to their run speed. Yeah, they would. I think it could be the same. Climb speed. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's not outside the realm of possibility because there are other. Like, I know that the tabaxis basically are able to climb as fast as they can uh, run. What do you think a chameleon would get for stat bonuses? Probably, <sighs> I would. Say, I would say constitution. Probably. And Probably maybe um, wisdom. Mm, charisma. Because charisma starts with chameleon. Car- <laughs> Charismelian. Charismelia. Charismelia. There, there you go. That sounds like a great idea. So yeah, no, that's a that's an interesting idea for a variant. Here's here's one that I came that I was thinking of the sec- last uh, a minute ago. Okay, this is what I'm thinking. Bat. Now, bat? Think, a bat. Think about that though, because uh, you know, man bat was like Batman's, like, uh, it w- was kind of like Batman, but was a-, a bat that was resembled a man. But then also, if you look at, like, Scorch Beasts in the Fallout universe, those things are mean. But here- here's what I was thinking about bats. Okay, so, like, kind of like an Aarakocra, they'd be able to fly, right? But I think that there's a real thing that you could do with, like, it would be similar to Dark Vision, but it would be based in sound, and so I they mean... would have, like, subsonic uh, hearing. That's so called blind able... sense. Oh, okay, blind sense. Yeah. Okay. In, in other, I don't know if in five E it's blind sense as well, but blind sense okay. would be you're using other senses to basically navigate. You're Although terrible. bats, bats don't have bad vision. They're just they can locate things a lot better with echolocation. Yeah, yeah. but they um, they can see, so they're not blind by any means. Well, I mean, that's like dolphins, too. You know, they can see. It's just that echolocation helps them locate things from further away than they can see. Right. What I was thinking of is that would give them a distinct advantage. It would almost be like dark vision. But yeah, like you said, blind sense. Uh, So it really would only be negative. Like, they would never really be in complete darkness unless there was like an area of silence or some kind of spell. I mean. Around that would prevent them from hearing. Yeah, um, a blind sense doesn't matter about vision, so... Yeah. And I think that they could have a natural weapon, too, for biting. And if they, if they did, maybe... May, oh, how about if you had that bat character, and then they got vampirism? Why would you give them vampirism? Because they're already a bat. I mean... So now they're a vampire bat, Alex. I think mean, I would that. make it so that they could function upside down just fine. Oh, that would be fun. Um, yeah, 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 because they could get to the top of uh, caves and stuff real easy, and then they could just sit there and wait. That would make them great for spies and ops. They, and they are at home in the underground, in the <laughs> caves. Yeah. yeah, that's a good place for them. See, the thing, the thing you have to realize when you're thinking of creatures to make races is, why would you make a race? So, what would you do with a man-sized bat? Um, run away. <laughs> quickly. Duh. All right, so what is the idea of having a man-sized bat? Like, what would that bring to a person wanting to play a character? Of course, you could obviously make Batman. Yeah, we would actually have a bat that wants to be Batman. Well, actually, that would be kind of interesting, because sometimes what I like to do is, like, mind palace this idea of if you took, like, superheroes or comic book characters or something like that, and you want to translate them into a world like Dungeons and Dragons, what would that version look like? As a person who's playing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, I had to think about, like, what would that a TMNT character look like if it was actually in, in a Dungeons and Dragons setting? Could you make that? And what would be the reality of the situation in, in that sort of setting? So, for a Batman kind of character, uh, yeah, an actual bat kind of makes sense. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense. I think that there should be a thing where they can bite, and they also can uh, regain some of their health when they bite an organic life form. See, but 
that just doesn't really work with like an actual bat. Well, but we're so making a man-sized fantasy bat. Maybe <laughs> maybe a fantasy maybe a fantasy bat can be a real vampire. Uh, speaking about vampire vampirism and bats, I actually mm. had an idea a while back for a subrace of goblin. Mm-hmm. So I had an idea and I wanted to make it and I just haven't gotten around to it. So I'll talk it out with you for a minute because why okay. not, right? Mm-hmm. What you so got? you have this race of goblins, like actual goblins, except they don't live underground necessarily or in caves and lairs like that. These ones are native to more of a jungle atmosphere and they don't live on the ground, but they live up in the trees, right? So these goblins are native to the treetop jungle area of, say, this really big forest. Uh, I had an idea for a place that doesn't really matter where. You could adapt them to anything. But they are kind of like pygmies. Uh, if you remember the Diablo 2 pygmies that had shrunken heads and um, oh, yeah. Yeah, blood I remember arts. Them. So these ones are basically bone eaters. They're nasty little goblins. They're black because of darkness. They they go out at night. They're nocturnal. They use bats as uh, riding animals, which is a thing they normally do, like dire bats. But they essentially, the reason that these goblins are the way they are is because they've got slightly um, vampiric origins. They're kind of blood drinkers, but not vampirism. They drink blood because it's just what they do. They're also bone eaters, but they also use the bones of the animals they kill and the creatures they kill to make weapons out of. So they've got bone spears, blow dart guns that use bone needles. They're familiar with poisons because they're in the jungle. So they're not like super deadly on their own, but when you've got a group of 20 goblins and they've all got poison blow dart guns. Yeah, no, that's you bad. You know, that, that, is, that is bad. Plus, they're riding yeah. bats. So the idea was that this race would be like that, and they'd live in the treetops, and they'd kind of be ambushers. Yeah. Because they sneak up on their prey. Yeah. And they no, gain up sounds, on it, uh... and they follow it, and they murder it. And then they yeah. eat the bones and the blood! They yeah, were supposed to be crazy. a very creepy goblin, obviously. And sounds like it, yes. So, so those are just the normal goblins, but the uh, goblin, like, because they have... Goblins in their society have the normal goblins, and they have, like, the goblin shamans or whatever. The elites, the higher-ups, the big goblins mm -hmm. uh, that aren't hobgoblins or bugbears. Mm. So, the higher-ups in the society of goblins would actually have manifested some uh, necrotic-type powers from vampirism. Because mm -hmm. just of how, how they are, and I don't have, like, any lore reasons for it, but... Right. So they're all necromantic and kind of vampiric-like, but the more powerful ones would actually have some access to, like, either blood magic or transformation into a bat form mm. or spell-like abilities that are driven from necromancy. Okay, okay. Because honestly, goblins uh, just kind of get used a lot as just cannon fodder. Like, you just oh, see yeah. goblins getting trolled a lot and just killing Hundreds and hundreds of poor little goblins. Oh, I love it. These ones would not be ones that are going to be just rolled over. They would be goblins that you would be unassumingly walking into their forest, and then suddenly 15 blow darts come out of nowhere. They're very good en masse. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. how goblins have to be used correctly. If but... you're going to use goblins, you use them en masse, or yeah. use them as just, again, cannon fodder. They are just sheeps to the slaughter. But the thing that I'm trying to figure out is, like, if you were making them something that you could play, uh, they'd kind of have to be able to at least hold their own. I mean, and... you, you could. You would still yeah. have the stats. And I know in 3.5, the stats that you got from picking a race were different than in 5e, because mm -hmm. 5e doesn't have any negatives at all. Mm -hmm. And 3.5 mm -hmm. did. Yeah. Uh, so, like, your half-orc gets a bonus to strength, and they used to get a negative to charisma, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think they had strength and constitution and got a negative to charisma because they're ugly. But mm -hmm. in 5e, mm -hmm. they're, I think it's just strength and charisma now, their constitution. Because I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, what would be perfect for them is if they were, like, uh, a wizard, 
and they were um, necromancer. They maybe they would, they would get for that. They would get bonuses to they would obviously get bonuses to dexterity, mm-hmm. um, because they're small and nimble. They would yeah. also get bonuses to like stealth because they're naturally darker. Well, in dark environments, they'd have dark vision. Um, they might have a couple. If again, the more powerful ones might develop spell like abilities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you could pull that from something. You could figure out like. Oh, well, once a day they can cast one of those spells that leeches life from things, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe yeah. once they reach, like, 6th or 7th level, they get the ability to turn into a, a bat, like, once a day for 10 minutes or something like that. If I'm correct, they did make a playable race for goblins, but I don't think they have any variations. Well, I mean, there's not a lot of variations that you see in goblins, typically. They're just kind of run in the middle of goblins here and there. Right, right. But, I mean, there's no reason, again, that you can't make variants for them. That's true. I mean, look at elves and dwarves Mm -hmm. and how many variations they have. I mean, even gnolls. I don't know if there's any, like, legit in the book variations on gnolls, but there's variations on gnolls because they're depending on the environment they're from. They would mm-hmm. have different colorations. They might not have any mechanical difference, but right. there's variations on the coloring and their attitudes, definitely. Oh, they, they definitely have attitude. Yeah, they do. So that's an, that's an idea, doing variations on things that are already established. I, I like variations um, because they're yeah. actually fairly easy to develop mm-hmm. as long as you try and keep them balanced. Right. Well, like... I don't think this was ever made as an official Dungeons and Dragons option, but I do know that like there were at least in in homebrewing there were like a few basic variants for turtles. Like when I was originally looking up turtles, um, so you had like the desert version, you had the Razorback, and you had I think the soft shell was the other one, and you could see why all of those would be beneficial. Uh, and why you would want to do different ones, you know, I, I could totally understand. I think the Desert Turtle, just because it's all about defense, is for a set number of times a day, you could, like, add your constitution modifier to your AC for, uh, for, yeah. for defense. But it, you could only do it a number of times between, like, long rests that was equal to your modifier. Yeah, them. and things so. like that you need to be careful of balance-wise, mm. because... Usually the abilities like that that you get come from mm-hmm. your class. Right. And so if you have powerful things from your race, mm-hmm. you need to find a way to balance that out the other way. Because you're like, yeah. oh, well, you can add like five to your AC three times a day or based on your modifier. Mm-hmm. That can be really overpowered if you are able to use it too much or if it lasts too long. Right. So there needs to be some drawback to have that good of an ability that's that's part of the reason i don't like a lot of homebrew stuff and i know now with the dm skilled adepts and all the dm skilled stuff there's a lot of more sanctioned you know maybe not Mm. for in everyone's game but it's more deliberately thought out and not just like i'm making a homebrew to break it they're actually balancing things way more yeah, what they what they were trying to do is make it an actual balanced thing you could implement without totally breaking the system that yeah. you, you have. It might not be something you can do for Adventures Guild or something like that, but, you know, if you wanted to do stuff that was, like, more in, in DM's Guild or even what they're bu- bringing out in Unearthed Arcana, they're even starting to rework that a lot, you know? Yeah. They, they keep coming up with different versions as time goes on, but that, that's stuff that's supposed to be implementable in the in in the actual game which brings me to the idea that uh maybe the maybe another episode we got to do is um you know different kind of classes that you could make oh uh, the, i mean that would be many episodes nathan there's 11 <laughs> base cla- 11 12 11 yeah, or 12 be- base classes and then there's at least three archetypes for each class well because i've seen some the i don't think they're considered adventures guild legal ones but they are other classes and subclasses that were made by watsi partnered people that are are listed on D beyond that are listed on official sites yeah 
I kind of want to dig into at some point because some of them are really interesting and I want to know the real application for them over some of the, the basic ones, but uh, that's for a different episode. <laughs> now, this, this also brings up something that we were talking about before, which uh, you had made the case that the most dangerous animal is a mosquito, that it kills more people than anybody else. Yes. Um, and I still say hippo because a hippo directly kills you. A mosquito needs a, a virus in order to do that. That is up to your philosophical beliefs, I suppose. But regardless, there is the possibility of creating an insectoid race. Yes. I, I know that they don't have one for, like, an official race, but I don't know if there's even a creature in Dungeons & Dragons that's reminiscent of it, but you'll probably correct well, me on that. Well, there's definitely bees. I don't remember the name of them the right bees. this second, but there are humanoid bees that exist. Oh, I want that. <laughs> I want to be a bee. Um, and I, again, I don't remember what they're named right now. Somebody can tweet at us or comment on this with the name of the, them. The special thing about, the hum about a playable race of bees is that you do have a natural defense. It's your stinger, and it deals... Like, massive damage, but you can only use it once, and after you do, your character dies. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> they've got some humanoid bees. Um, mm -hmm. aside from that, I don't really know of too many humanoid bugs. Okay. But I don't see why you couldn't do that. Like, maybe you could be a human praying mantis hybrid. Oh, well, that would be, uh, that would be a monk. That I mean, would be a perfect monk character right there. But there's billions, billions, there's lots of billions? insects. Billions. I mean, you could do arachnids. They have driders, though, so I wouldn't, I don't know if you'd really want to do an arachnid. Then you'd just be Spider-Man and be, the mechanics for an arachnid humanoid would be interesting. You'd probably just end up copying drider mechanics for it. Okay. Because driders are basically the spider equivalent to a centaur. I'm not sure if you've seen a drider before. Uh, I have not, but I will look it up. Driders are half drow, half spider. Why? Like, because, oh, wow. Yeah. Because Lolf a... likes to punish her constituents. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing it. So if you imagine that it's a centaur, but instead of the human part at the top, it's an elf, and instead of a horse at the bottom, it's a spider. Yeah, that's a that's drider. That's a drider. Okay. Yeah, a drow spider. Uh, I wonder if you could redo... <laughs> you know what the best way to kill a drider would be? Just shine a light at them? <laughs> no, no, no. To kill a drider, I think the best way you could do it is to use a reduce monster or reduce person spell on it, and shrink it down and then step on it. Or take and put it in a cup and put it outside. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, here's another thought you could do. Uh, like in the Monty Python, you just, you just draw a foot. Over the screen, and you just step on the drider. Or, or the other way you can do it is you can get a pipe, or a gutter at this point, and a water spout, and you make the drider crawl up it, and then you create water and drown the crap out of it. So, this all brings me to uh, the thing that I think everybody really wanted to get to. How do we create a party that basically mimics Madagascar, the movie? I think this episode's over. <laughs> <laughs> Because let's you see, don't. We, got the, we got the hippo, we got the giraffe, we got the zebra, we got the lion. How do we make You got those? a Khajiit. You got the Khajiit? Well, you used the, the lion. tabaxi. You could use a centaur as a uh, zebra. I mean, I suppose you could just take the luxodon and you could just make it a hippo instead. I mean, sure. It you wouldn't get... have the trunk. We're not making Madagascar. Let's just go with that. <laughs> How about Lion King? No. Can I make Timon and Pumbaa? I mean... I need a warthog, you, and I you need could, a... You could make an anthropomorphic boar. Okay. I would I would base them off a of half-orc if I was going to make them, because the half-orcs already have the tusks, so you could make bigger tusks. Okay. Maybe give them a gore attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would, they would have to have some kind of uh, thing. With they the would tusks. get, like... No. You don't give them a gore attack. You give them a rage ability without being a barbarian. Oh. Because, because boars are nasty. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. But you also give them advantage to perception checks that are based on smell. I would imagine, though, that like when they're in some kind of a rage state, that they also have some limited perception or something like that, because they're so focused on 
one particular it would be like a blind rage it'd be a blind rage where yeah. you just focus on the object of your rage and you okay don't stop until you're either out cold or until the rage subsides or the target even if the target's dead you don't stop so yeah because the only thing i'm thinking is that that would be pretty potent if you were playing a thing besides a barbarian because you'd still have rage with whatever i mean it depends you you could make it not as good as you want like you could make it so you have to like if you take more than your half your total hit points of damage in a single yeah. hit for instance yeah you could make it so that you have to make a constitution saving throw and if you fail it you go into a rage yeah you don't almost like it's an uncontrollable one yeah maybe you don't get to choose your targets maybe it has to just yeah, be the uncontrollable target uncontrollable rages you don't i would assume you Go for the closest target, or if you can see the person that hits you and you know they hit you, you'd go after them. Which could be really dangerous if your party is in, like, in close quarters and you just start attacking your own. Yeah, you charge right at them. It, so basically, your blind rage in some ways can be a very negative thing and if it's not implemented properly. I mean, yeah, but it's no worse than a sorcerer that does wild magic. Also, while you're raging, you can't use spells. So if you're a caster, then, well... Th that would be a very um, difficult character to play. I would also imagine that human-boar hybrid thing probably would not be naturally very good at intelligence or magic-related things chances are probably a fighter class but what about lemur why we made pumba now i need to mow. i don't i mean you'd have to have a lemur be based off something like gnome sized and lean like you could almost just make a dire lemur and give that it <laughs> exceptional intelligence just like a weasel well, I, <laughs> yeah i mean i'm thinking that probably the benefits of it would be that it it probably got really high dexterity. Yeah, they would probably have pretty good dexterity. They're probably um, good at things like uh, thievery and pickpocketing. Sneaking. And sneaking, and yeah, and to getting into small spaces. Like, I imagine that they could actually be very useful if, like, you know, if you wound up with openings or crevasses that are too small for most characters to get through, a, a lemur could figure out how to get in there. Like, you could, you could yeah, get through I mean, a fairly small space. They might actually be fairly useful as characters. Maybe. I mean, Especially they're as... small, they're stealthy, they're quick, they're agile. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, yeah, they could yeah. be interesting. Again, yeah. I don't know what you do for mechanics of a lemur, because I don't really know what they're like. Uh, yeah, I think they could have a burrow speed. Cause they, do they, they burrow? Yeah. That's why, you, that's why you always see, like, the little uh, lemurs, like, pop out of the ground. You know how you, set, you see them all just kind of, like, go whoop? And they're up. Yeah. Uh, you, so they could have a burrow speed that's like equivalent to like their, their walking speed. Yeah, probably like half their walking speed. Let's be all realistic. Yeah, all right. Um, half their walking speed. I bet they, um, I could see where they would have advantage to saving throws against grappling. Because they're hard to like grab onto. You'd, you'd have to, they're slippery. Like a mink. They're like a mink. They're of the weasel persuasion. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> some so like that. so. Would you give a would you give a lemur a dexterity bonus and a charisma bonus then? Uh, yes, I think those would be the most logical things to or do. Or would you give it dexterity and intelligence? It's a good question. No, yeah. I think I think charisma. I think charisma probably makes because sense because they're so cute. They're so cute, and if you remember Timon, you know, fast talker. Always, yeah, you know, that, the communication that's true. That's true. kind of character, you know, that would kind of make sense. And that would actually make them perfectly suited to be like a rogue. I mean, here's actually. the thing, you don't, you, I mean, you can think of races having specific classes in mind, but mm. you don't want to tailor make them to be exceptionally good at a specific class. Yeah, but I mean, because you, you want them to it, be versatile. Right. But if you think about it, a lot of them, uh, will definitely lend themselves well to certain play styles. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, ability-wise. that way. Again, but. not every race needs to have, like, special abilities. I mean, right. they do have abilities, so you might give your uh, lemur a burrow ability. Like, mm -hmm. they're able to burrow at half their walking speed into yeah. the ground. Yeah. Up to whatever, kind of like a dwarf stone-cutting abilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But you don't need to make, like, anything that's, like, combat-specific. Right. Or that's, like, oh, get yeah, a yeah. jail-free card, or, you know. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm playing, like, 
I'm playing a character who's not particularly well suited for the class that that he's in. I mean, um, sort you know, of. I mean, he's not stealthy, but I mean, I think he makes a good uh, monk. He does make a good monk. He doesn't make a particularly good shadow monk because yeah. he, you know his dexterity is real low, and turtles don't have dark vision. So, so, so there's so, so there's some definite limitations to what they can do. But what he what he makes up for is that he's strong and he is really hard to hit. He's very he's very girthy. So, he's very good in hand to hand combat. What it, what it does is that it actually makes him really versatile because he still has some shadow abilities that help him out in a pinch, and he can utilize them in interesting ways. But he he's also kind of like a a straightforward. I hit things with my staff kind of character clearly you just need to cross class maybe um you know what that's probably why people choose human as a race right because, because they're you, versatile you just get a bonus to every one of your stats and that's it it's just it's it's straightforward you can play any kind of character you're going to be perfectly well suited regardless yeah, I mean, yes or no well you can do any of those classes equally well i mean you can do that with any class depending on your roles anyways I don't know, like, I keep thinking to myself, like, there are some, like, to go back to a tabaxi, a tabaxi is great for rogues, you know, because they they would also be great as bards. Yeah, I suppose they would, but I guess what I'm thinking is, one, they're fast, you know. That means they'd also make a very agile fighter. Hmm, that's true. Then they also have the dark vision. They'd also make a really good monk, because they're light and fast. That's true. And they're able to fly, so they could fly down and dive bomb you. Right. With monk unarmed damage. Right. I can see that. Also imagine a flying barbarian rage. Ooh, that's fun. Yeah, as I said, they can be as versatile as you need them to. Yeah, imagine an air. I wanted to make an Aarakocra as a druid, so that I could fly up, and then I could turn into a bear, and I could be a literal drop bear. That's my thing. Well, then you gotta make that character. I already have that character. Hephaestus would turn into whatever, fly into the air, jump up in, over a hole in a pit, and turn to a bear on the way down. Or climb okay. up into the ceiling as a spider, and then turn into a bear. Is it fair to say that if I were building, like, a playable race that was based around animals, that if I were giving them any of the typical things that you see a druid being able to turn into, like like the swim speed of fish or the flight ability of an eagle, it's not out of the realm of possibility to just give those to a playable uh, race because a druid could turn into any one of them anyway. See, here's the thing with that, though. Druids don't get those until later. They don't get them to begin with, and they don't get them at first when they be able when they are able to shapeshift. So, like... Right. The ability to turn into an animal with shapeshift that has a swim speed, mm. I don't think you get into, like, 6th level. Okay, but the and druid... flight mm. is later than that. It's, like, 8 or 9. But the, the druid, once they do have that, they can turn into animals that allow them to have, you know, an equitable swim speed or breathing underwater or being able to fly... What I'm talking about is when you have a, a playable race, yeah, they can do it naturally at first level, but they only really have one of those things. Like, they only have, like, the ability to have a swim speed, or they only can, they can fly. They can't swim, but they can fly, you know. They don't have the versatility, but it is one of those things that you could see an animal of a comparable level, or even a, like, a, a CR1, CR1 half or whatever monster is able to have that as a thing. I mean, so it made sense that a I mean, that's the thing. With with the a race being able to do it, mm-hmm. I don't know what the Aarakocra and the um, Kenku get for flight. I assume it's limited. If I were to look it up, I don't think the Kenku can fly. So it's uh, a flightless bird? No, I don't think they do. Uh, but the Aarakocra, if I remember correctly, uh, you have a flying speed of 50 feet. To use the speed, you can't be wearing medium or heavy armor. Is there anything else? That's it? Nope, that's it. That's all they so say they about just... flight. So yeah, I mean... As long as you're wearing light armor or clothing, you can fly 50 feet. I assume you would also have to be lightly encumbered. Doesn't say. Uh, well, it's, 
It may not say it specifically, but if you have to not be wearing medium or heavy armor, then it means you can't have a load that's more than like 25 pounds. But they themselves only have bodies that weigh 80 to 100 pounds. Well, medium armor is generally 25 pounds or heavier. Not like by average weight, but by Mm -hmm. like a chain shirt is like 25 pounds, and that's light armor. So Mm -hmm. anything heavier than like 30 to 35 tends to be like medium breastplate is a medium armor. So anything like above 30 pounds would be a medium. So I assume... To do that, you'd want to be lightly encumbered. You wouldn't want to be carrying, say, a, a 12-pound greatsword mm-hmm. and a tower shield. Oh, but that's fun. Yeah, also, how are you going to fly if you're holding a greatsword? It's fantasy. Yeah, I'm just just deal with it. <laughs> it's, you gotta it's use your fantasy. wings. I assume your wings are your arms. It's not crazy, They, although that is faster mm-hmm. than any other characters can move. So that's what's interesting. Even though it's legal, yeah. I think that's a bit much. I would say a flying speed of maybe 40, but not 50. Because then imagine your monk. What's their uh, land speed? Base walking speed, 25 feet. See, they're slower on land, and I assume swimming they'd be even slower. <laughs> it actually doesn't even say that they could swim or not. I mean, <laughs> so maybe most, most things can swim without saying yeah. they can swim. But I'm guessing that the swim speed is low i mean i don't there may not be a rule for it but with all the feathers uh yeah and i would imagine that if you've gotten in the water uh flying is going to be hard for a little while i mean as a dm i would rule that it's like yeah your wings are soaked but to but to say basically that like if i were building a, a race considering that they have already made it pretty well established that there are races or sub races that are able to do those things. It's not out of the realm of possibility that I would build it. Like, if I said that I wanted to have, like, my Batman race, right? It nah, wouldn't... Nah, nah, it, nah, nah, nah. it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that I would look at the Aarakocra and say, well, the Aarakocra can do a 50-foot flight speed. Yeah. It, it's not out of the realm of possibility. That's, that's an official playable race, so my Bat race could do that, too. That's not out of the realm of possibility, no. A- again, it will depend on what other abilities you want to give them. Right. And whatnot. But mm-hmm. if, say, that's the only thing you're giving them is a flight speed, mm-hmm. and then, like, the ability to hang upside down without any issue, for right. instance, right. that wouldn't be too OP, because that's not a whole lot. Yeah. I think we've talked for quite a while. We might eventually have to come back to this as we start now. Mind pals. <laughs> for the next week or so, we're going to be like, what other animals could we make? But, uh, so we might actually, uh, end up coming back to this at some point. Uh, we'll have and, to do a live uh, show about it. Maybe we'll do a live <laughs> show about it. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we'll do in March. When we do the, the show in March, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, uh, get people's ideas on this. So if you're hearing this, and, uh, you end up joining us for that, bring, bring in the animal and what you want to do with it. Uh, however, in the meantime, now that we've gotten completely, uh, you know, in touch with our spirit animals, if uh, folks would like to get in touch with their Delve-related animal spirit, uh, where could they go? You can find more Delve over at DelveCast.com. Yep, and you can find all of our projects over there, uh, not just Delve, but also Orbital and Attempting to Play and the, uh, the other special things, kind of like the off-topic things that we do. Uh, and please click on our Patreon banner when you go. Uh, and check out some of the uh, the extra offerings that we have, like a, a longer extended conversation, apparently on this one, about Monopoly for Millennials. There's something you can find over there right now. Um, for just a whole dollar a month, you can get all of that content unlocked. Uh, and thank you to our shiny little patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. Uh, I would also like to just say, uh, if you have uh, us on Facebook, thank you very much. Uh, we do try to post over there. And if you want to find us on Twitter, uh, I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And uh, if you use any sort of podcast apps, please rate and review and subscribe. So like iTunes, Google Play, and uh, Spotify. Let, it, let us know, or just do that thing and share it with your friends if you think they'd like us. Because we could always use more listeners and visibility. More people listening uh, hopefully creates a better conversation. And uh, and gets more input, and we like input. Nathan Nathan just wants to see himself on the top two hundred again. Yeah, it happens rarely, but uh, it it would be nice if I just 
if, if just like suddenly I just went on there and it's like, ooh. We, we like to know that you like our show. Yeah, we would love to have better uh, engagement, more engagement with people and have conversations with them. Absolutely. Speaking of engagement and conversations with people on Twitter and bigger audiences, shout out to Crits McCrits for our episode last week. They enjoyed that and let us know how they felt about health and damage in games. Yes, and uh, so we always like to have that input because it gives us something to really uh, to, to work off of. You know, we get to have a conversation. So we know we're not just shouting into a void. You know, people are I mean, actually... <laughs> we are shouting into we a are. void. <laughs> we do. We do. Can anybody hear us? So, uh, so thank you for that. And uh, to everybody who uh, is uh, able to give us uh, new input. Input's great, you know. And uh, it's something I like to say, you know, if you have creators that you like out there, if you're not able to support them in a financial sense or be on their Patreons, uh, just being able to be actively engaged with them is great. And uh, I would always encourage you to, to do that, to, to make your comments, to be part of the community. They really appreciate that. I know we do. So uh, until next time, uh, we are going to go and think of other spirit animals that we can <laughs> tune ourselves to. Sabertooth Tiger. That's no. the next one. Bangs. No. It's going to be a variant of a tabaxi. Sabertooth Tabaxi. <sighs> Saber Tabaxi. Until next time, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Uh, and then if I go to, like, the, uh, Park Place and the Boardwalk Squares, they're actually, uh, a three-day music festival and a week-long meditation retreat. Thoughts? A week-long meditation retreat? Millennials can yeah. afford that. No. <laughs> According to this, it's like 50 Monopoly bucks in this world. Millennials still can't afford that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm on... 50 Monopoly. And... We need For to make sure. a uh, a race for D and D. That's a uh, anthropomorphic um, porcupine. Oh, that would be great. And oh, you know what would be a great skill for it to have? It could do like a natural defense thing as a ranged attack. They they'll love to have the thought process that led to this. But okay, so I'm gonna. Will they or will they be like, wow, we're listening to a lot. oh, there's an episode attached to this. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how much extra you get, folks. <laughs>